Well, good evening. Good evening, everyone. We're certainly glad you are come to worship with us tonight. We're glad you're here. Um, we had just a few announcements, and as we know, school has started. Please pray for the uh, back-to-school rally. Brother Derek, that is Wednesday night. Leaving here at what time? 5.45. Wednesday night, students for the back-to-school rally. And uh, be in prayer for them, pray for the teachers as they've all gone back to school and the students. So I want to pray for that. And also want to be in prayer for our upcoming Awana starting and uh, also our other ministries we have going on. The ladies' prayer breakfast is Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. It's brunch, so come on and hang out with them. And um, they, got a, they got a good plan uh, together for that, for the ladies' prayer breakfast this Saturday morning for the Bible conference. And that brings us to what the, the big announcement I have for tonight is the Bible conference. It starts next Sunday morning, next Sunday night, and Monday night. Mark your calendars. And uh, for that, it, it, it's something to uh, be sure to come be a part of. We will not be having the noonday lunch on Monday. Dr. Sullivan has to go back for a procedure on his heart. But at this time, as we get ready to uh, start our service, we will have a special time and call our church together for a special time of prayer for the Bible conference. And uh, on the front pew here, there is some uh, handout, some posters. Take those posters. There's more of those tickets. You know, it, they're not going to do any good left here this week. You need to take them with you. The little Bible markers that, that Brother Eric had printed up. And uh, at this time, we're going to ask if you want to pray. You can pray at your seat or you can come down. We're going to have someone pray for Dr. Sullivan. And that's going to be uh, Gary Cockrell. And then we're going to ask Bobby James to pray for Ted Trailer. And if you guys will come on to the stage. And then we're going to have, uh, i got to see who I want to pray for, uh, Jeff Laborde. Uh, for that. Roger, won't you pray for Jeff Laborde tonight? You'll come pray if you'll come up on the stage. And however you want to, um, Brent and I were talking, Eric asked me Friday to be in prayer about this, and I told Brent, I said, Lord, just lay down my heart for let's pray for all three of these men by name. So if you'd like to come and pray at the altar for the Bible conference, you come on and do that now. Come be a part of, of this. And if you want to pray at your pew, that's fine. But we're going to pray for all three of these men. And want to pray for the attendance of um, the Bible conference, for our attendance and for us. You can pray at your pew or you can come down to the front and give you just a minute to do that. It is Sunday morning at 10 o'clock after Sunday school. It's 6 o'clock on Sunday night and then 6.30 on Monday night. If you'd like to come and pray, you're more than welcome to do that. This time we're going to pray and we're going to ask uh, Gary to start and then Bobby and then uh, Roger if they will. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to call you Lord. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. And Lord, as we come tonight, we want to lift uh, this uh, Bible conference up to you. And Lord, tonight I especially want to pray brother John Sullivan father he's got uh, a bad heart valve and the procedure that they do with that uh, they say it's simple but uh, sometimes it's not quite so simple so we just Lord we need you to just touch him I pray, Father, that uh, you would just uh, be with him, be with the doctors that, and nurses that are ministering to him. And, Lord, I pray that uh, this will be a total success. And, Lord, that uh, nothing uh, untoward would take place uh, during uh, this surgery, that everything will go fine. And, Lord, we just... Uh, we lift him up to you because, Lord, he's precious to us. He's been here so many times, and what a humble person he is. And, Lord, we, we, we reach out to you tonight and ask you to touch his body. 
Give him strength. I pray for all of these that are coming, Lord, that uh, they will have traveling grace to and from our church. So bless them, Lord, and I pray, Father, that uh, Dr. Sullivan will have a, a quick recovery from this and be back about uh, the work that I know that he so dearly loves. And Lord, we pray it all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Father, I just come to you today and uh, just give praise for your son. Lift up the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that you are almighty God, Father, the awesome creator, the great physician the great sustainer father but you're also our shepherd father and i thank you for that and father as we come into this uh next week with the bible conference father, i just pray that you would move even now throughout this week amongst this church moving our hearts just prepare us to receive your word father i just pray that the word would spread in, in this community that you would draw people to this place next sunday and monday Father, that even a revival would start with this conference, Father. I just, I just pray for every aspect of it, Father, that you would just bless and anoint it. Let your Holy Spirit just move freely, Father. I lift up our brother, Ted Trailer, that you would, even now, just give him strength and, and an unction from on high, Father, that you would just fill him with your Holy Spirit. And just prepare him, Father, to be the vessel that you would have us to hear your word through, Father. And you'd just speak a mighty word through him. Father, that you'd give him mercy and grace and, and give him safety and travel, Father. Bring him, bring him safely to us, Father, that he can bring your message, Father. And it would just impact so many lives. And you would just touch hearts and, and do a mighty work in each of us individually, Father. We love you. We thank you for all that you do, all that you're going to do, Father, and all that you're going to do through this conference. And we give you all the praise and the glory for it, Father. And we ask these things in the precious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Father, we lift up Brother Jeff LeBorn to you. Father, anybody that has heard him knows that he's got such a different, such a special kind of delivery, Lord, of the gospel. But Lord, with that delivery, it is nothing without your anointing. Father, we know that you have anointed him. We pray, Lord, that when he's going to be here, that Lord, that your anointing will be here as well to touch lives, to change lives, to shake lives, Lord, that need to be shaken and encouraged. But, Lord, we look to you for our help, for, Lord, for our country, certainly for our church and for the ones that will be here. Father, we love you, and we thank you for all your, your blessings that you have given us, that you've blessed us with, with this church, with your leadership. And, Father, we'll praise you. We look forward to the results that will be coming out of this Bible conference. But, Lord, that you would get praise, that you would get honor, that it would mean the eternity in heaven with you for some. Father, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 The, the thing we can do every day this week is to pray for the Bible conference, lift it up, and like I said, there's posters and uh, more of the Bible, uh, Bible markers. Get those and hand them out. And I challenge us every day this week, let's pray for the Bible conference. And uh, as we lift these men up, that God will move in a mighty way. And we're certainly glad you're here to worship with us tonight. Amen. It's good to see you tonight. I'm going to ask you to uh, stand and uh, fellowship with those around you as the instruments play. We bring the sacrifice of praise. <laughs>
sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer up to you the sacrifices of thanksgiving. one says, Bow down thine ear, O Lord, and hear me, for I am poor and needy. I need thee every hour. Most gracious Lord, let's sing. I need thee every hour. Most gracious Lord, no tender voice like mine can Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Father, for this uh, day, and Father, for bringing us all back safely. Father, we just ask as we come to this time in the service where we take up these offerings and give back to you, Father. Father, we just ask that they be used for the furtherance of your kingdom, Father, and I just ask you to be with Brother Brent as he brings a message, Father, that you just speak through him, Father. We thank you for all you do. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs>
Jesus than silver or gold I'd rather be his than have riches untold I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land I'd rather be led by his nail pierced hands than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I'd rather have Jesus than man's applause. I would rather be faithful to his dear cause I'd rather have Jesus than a worldwide fame I would rather be true to his holy name than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I would rather, I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world afford today I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today Thank you greatly, Roger. I want to invite you to take your Bibles and uh, open them to the book of Hebrews. And uh, we are looking tonight at the subject, Into His Presence. Into His Presence. And uh, as we prayed for our Bible conference a while ago, let's, let's do take that to heart to pray every day this week. I think it'll make a difference not only in our lives as we prepare, but uh, as we engage in helping uh, to come along for prayer, it makes a tremendous difference. Uh, prayer really does. In the passage that we're looking at tonight, I've got a, a lot that uh, is in these verses, and there's no way to cover the, the whole gist of everything. I, I'm going to try to get to the last part, which will be into His presence, where I would like to, to spend our time. So if you'll read with me here in the, the book of Hebrews, the sixth chapter, and we're going to drop down to verse 13 and read down through verse 20. The writer of Hebrews says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, 
Because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for a confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Please join me in prayer. Father, thank you for each one gathered this night in your house. Thank you for the song service, the prayer time, us just coming together as a body of believers, the fellowship we have one with another. And Father, I pray now, as we've opened your word, that you would speak to our hearts in a very mighty way this night. I pray you would use me to speak your truth in clarity under the unction and guidance of your Holy Spirit. I pray, Father, that this your people would have open ears and receptive hearts and that your spirit would have great freedom in our presence to take your word and to cause it to become alive and living in our lives, that your will would be accomplished through it and your purpose for our lives, that we would know it even better, that we would be energized and strengthened uh, to go forward from this day to uh, serve you, to work for you, uh, in this day that we live in, that's such a difficult day. Father, we need your strength. We need your help. And Father, we do pray for our Bible conference coming up. These men that are coming, Father, they are such worthy uh, uh, ministers in, in sharing your word and preaching the gospel. We pray for your blessing upon them as they travel, as they prepare, and as they come. Father, we just pray that we would have our hearts ready and our lives ready, and that we would see a mighty outflowing of your Spirit. But we're thankful that you're here with us tonight. And I pray, Father, you'd bless in this time as we open your Word, and I pray your, uh, your, your Spirit would take this Word and just bring it into our lives that we might be sped, fed spiritually and that we might be strengthened in a very mighty way. All this we pray in... The most wonderful name of all, in the name of Jesus. Amen. In these verses that we look at, um, there are three things that, that, that we have to grasp. Well, there's really more than three things. Three things I want to mention. Uh, that we'll um, look at the first two in brevity and the last one in a little more depth. The first thing is the promise of God. The second thing is the purpose of God. And finally, the presence of God. And what you find is, you know, if you ever step back and take a giant overview of all of everything of what God has done from before time until uh, all the way through the end of time, you find that everything goes according to the promise, according to the purpose, and it's all about bringing us into His presence. And we find that the promise of God brings us to the purpose of God, and the purpose of God brings us into the presence of God. And so as we look at these three things, we see that the writer of Hebrews begins here speaking of the promise. He says, for when God made a promise to Abraham. Now, in order to grasp the promises, and it says uh, in verse 15, and so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. 
Now, if you would hold your hand here in the book of Hebrews and jump back with me to the book of Galatians, and we'll be in the third chapter of Galatians. We're coming back to Hebrews in a minute. But Galatians lays out for us about the promises of God. Now, there's a lot of promises in the Bible that God has given, many promises. But the most essential promise that we have is the promise of salvation. And if you boil everything down to what's really the most important, the most important promise is not that you'll have uh, wealth, health, and, and, a, and a wonderful time in this earthly life. The most important thing is our salvation. And so it says here, Paul writes in, in the letter to the church at Galatia, and if you'll drop down with me to verse 16, I will actually begin with 15. He says, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or add to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. What purpose then? does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through the angels by the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. And now as we read these verses, it talks about the promise. It says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Now he's speaking specifically of the promise of salvation. And that's what God did when he called out the man Abraham, who was a pagan idolater, lived in Ur of the Chaldees, present day Kuwait area, possibly uh, in, in the Babylon area of Iraq. Uh, but he was... Uh, a pagan idolater, and God broke into his life and began to speak to him and began to speak to him about salvation. And he made some wonderful promises to Abraham. He said, uh, Abraham, get out of your country from, uh, your, from your father's house to a land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. I will bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. And in you shall all the nations or the families of the earth be blessed. Now, that's a tremendous promise in your seed. He, he, he called Abraham out one night. He said, I want you to look at the stars in the heaven. That's what uh, your seed is going to be like. And I want you to look at the sand of the sea, the dust of the earth. That's what your seed is going to be like. Abraham says, how can this be? I don't even have a son. And so... The, the promise that God gave to Abraham, where it says that as he waited patiently, he waited patiently for the son of promise to be born. And we all know the story of Abraham. He got ahead of God. He, uh, he, he and Sarah decided they'd help God out with his purpose and his plan. God didn't need any help. God was waiting till, till Abraham's body was completely dead according to the flesh and Sarah's time for childbearing was gone and then God brought the son of promise into their lives. Isaac was born when Abraham was a hundred years old and Sarah was ninety years old. And there was no question that it was a miracle by God. He was the son of the miraculous birth. And I want you to know in Isaac the promises of God were there that through him, through his seed, uh, the Abraham's seed to Isaac, Isaac's to Jacob, Jacob to the twelve tribes, specifically the tribe of Judah, that would come the son of promise. He would come. And, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now to Abraham and his seed were promises made. 
the promises were made. Now, Abraham ended up with a lot of seed. You know, he had children. Uh, he had Ishmael, and Ishmael had all those sons, the Arab race. He had children later through Katera after Sarah had died. Abraham had a lot of seed. But there was only one seed that fulfilled the lineage of the promise that God had purposed and promised, and that was through Isaac. Now, was salvation through Isaac? No, salvation was through Jesus. But he was, the seed came from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to the, uh, through, the, through the tribe of Judah, through David, down to the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. Now, how did salvation come to Abraham's life? Did he keep the law to get salvation? No, he was 430 years before the law. The Bible says Abraham believed and it was accounted or imputed to him for righteousness. He exercised faith and he stepped out on faith and he believed God and God accounted it for righteousness to him. Now, it goes on to say, well then what purpose does the law give? It was added because of transgression. Well, what was the law added to? It was added to that covenant that God established with this man by the name of Abraham. And it was added because of transgressions till what? The seed should come. And then after the seed comes, we don't need the law to be our teacher anymore because we now have Jesus Christ. So to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. If you're going to get in on salvation, and if you want to understand the purpose of God, you've got to first get in on the promise of God, and that's the promise of salvation. And that promise is that whosoever will can come to the Lord freely and receive Him as Savior, receive Him as Lord of their life, turn from their sin, turn to Him in repentance, and by faith commit your heart and life to Jesus Christ, and you will experience the wonderful promise of salvation. The Jews don't hold uh, uh, the, 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 the corner, they don't have the market cornered on salvation. It's to anyone and everyone. The United States doesn't have the market cornered on salvation. The, the people who live in the southern part of the United States doesn't have the market cornered on salvation. God is no respecter of persons. And don't you ever let anybody tell you that only a certain few can be saved. That's not biblical. And the Bible doesn't teach it. God says, whosoever will shall come. And all you have to do to get, on the one, get in on the wonderful promise of God is get in Jesus Christ. You say, well, how do I get in Jesus Christ? You're born in Him. You know how you get born in Him? You get born from above, born spiritually. And the moment you receive Him, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit takes you and baptizes you spiritually into Christ Jesus and you're in Christ from that moment forever before. And no one, Jesus said, can pluck you out of my hand. But the Bible says we are hidden in Christ. And that can never be undone. So if you're ever going to get in on the promise of God that He's given to us, it's about salvation. Now there's a lot of promises in the Bible. And we could go all night long into the net tomorrow and not cover all the promises. But the greatest promise God has ever given us is the promise of salvation. Now, what the promise of God of salvation does for us, it brings us into the purpose of God. Now, when we're getting into the purpose of God, we're getting into the nitty-gritty of really why we're here and what it's all about. You know, there's a lot of people who want, to, want to say, well, exactly why we're here. Why are we actually here? You start to find that in the purpose of God. Now, hold your... Well, we, don't, go back to, don't go back to Hebrews just yet. Jump on over to the book of Ephesians in chapter 1. If, if you're ever going to grasp the purpose of God, Paul does a tremendous, uh, uh, give us tremendous enlightenment on the purpose of God here in the first chapter of the book of Ephesians. He writes this beginning with verse one of, verse 3 of chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us 
according to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise, of, to the glory of his, pray, of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. Look what it says, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in, in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. In him we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according look what it says again the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. Two times in that passage it speaks of the purpose of God. It says that He purposed in Himself and then it says that He works all things, that uh, in Him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. Now, hold your hand in, 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 here in Ephesians and jump back to Hebrews and, and I want you to look at something with me. It says in the sixth chapter of Hebrews in the passage that we're looking at, in verse 17, thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, that's those who've experienced salvation, the immutability of His counsel, confirmed it by an oath. Well, what counsel is He talking about? It's the same counsel that He mentions here in Ephesians 1, that He works all things according to the counsel of His will. Now that's pointing back to the fact that God held a council. You say, when did this council uh, meeting take place? It, went, it goes back all the way before time began. Before earth was created, before the universe was created, when there was only God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, a council was held. It's called the council of the Godhead. And if you're ever going to grasp the purpose of God, you've got to go to the council of God. And you go back to the council of the Godhead before time began, and, and you find that God the Father had a purpose. What was God the Father's purpose? God the Father wanted to create a being who would, from His free will choice, honor God with worship and service. And God said, in order for this to take place, we'll have to create a stage for this created being to have a place to be. And so God created all the universe, and specifically a little planet, in the middle of that vast universe that we call earth, God created this earth and God created all of the vegetable and vegetation life and the trees and the mountains and the oceans and all the grandeur of this creation. And then God created all the animals of the world and God created the land animals and the sea animals and the birds of the air as, as fit for this one created being that was His purpose. Now, and then as the crowning act of His created purpose, God formed man from the dust of the earth, the only part of His creation that He got in with His hands, and He took from the dust of the earth, and He created man, and He breathed into that man. Where was I? It created, he breathed into that man, the nostrils of that man, Adam, the very breath of life. 
And he became a living soul. Now don't you ever let anybody tell you that God created the snail darters and they're just as important to God as you and I are. That's a lie. And don't you ever let anybody tell you that a tree is more important to God than us. Now I'm not for destroying the planet and I'm not for just mowing down trees for no purpose. And I hadn't killed a snail daughter in two or three years, I don't think. I ain't out hunting snail daughters. But you know what? I understand the purpose of God was in us. You see, God gets worship from nobody but us. A dog doesn't worship God. I, I've told you before, I like to got myself skin up, side down ways and sideways. I was in a hospital room and this lady, she'd about died. and She wasn't about that big around. And she said, well, if I'd have died, I, I'd, have, I'd have gone to see my dogs that are already in heaven. And I made the mistake of telling that lady, no, ma'am, your dogs aren't in heaven. If her husband hadn't held her down, she'd have come up out of that bed after me. She said, you can't tell me. I said, ma'am, your dog don't have a soul. We are distinct of all God's creative work. And it's all back to His purpose. What was His purpose? To have someone who would honor Him and worship Him out of a free will choice. Now listen to me. In the purpose of God the Father... God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit realized as they, uh, before time began, looked at creation, that if they acted in creation, that they would also have to act in redemption. Because man would be sinful. And man would choose to be disobedient to God. And the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead, told the Father, I will purchase your purpose through the redemption of my own blood. And there before the foundation of the world in this council of the Godhead, as God the Father had this great purpose, God the Son said, I will purchase your purpose. And God the Holy Spirit said, I'll go down there and perform the purpose of the Father that the Son's willing to purchase. And there you have the great redemptive work of the Godhead beginning before time ever began. That's why the Bible says that we were predestined before the foundation of the world. That's why the Bible says that Jesus was seen slain from the foundation of the world. God was not caught off guard by sin. God's purpose was greater than sin because God wanted us to honor Him and worship Him and that's the good pleasure of His will that He gets when we from a free will choice honor Him and worship Him. But when sin entered and death by sin and sin brought separation, redemption was the only solution. And God's plan of redemption is bringing us back into a relationship with Him so that we could fulfill His purpose of honoring Him and worshiping Him and serving Him. Now then, the promise of God is about salvation. The purpose of God is about honoring and worship Him. And you can never honor God and worship God and serve God until you've experienced salvation. These people tell us that they're going to go worship God. If you are not saved, you can't worship God because Jesus nailed it down when He spoke to the woman at the well in the fourth chapter of John. He said, God is spirit and those that worship Him must worship Him in what? Spirit and in truth. Those who are not saved, they're spiritually dead. They cannot worship God. Only you and I in God's redemptive plan, after we've received Jesus as Lord and Savior, can we worship God and choose to honor Him and choose to serve Him? And so the promise of God of salvation, and once we've experienced that, brings us into the purpose of God, honoring Him, worshiping Him. And when you truly worship God in spirit and truth, you are achieving the highest uh, point of what you are truly created for and what I'm created for that we can ever do is when we worship God. But listen to me carefully. I said all that quickly to say this. 
the promise of God of salvation brings us into the purpose of God that we honor Him, we serve Him, we worship Him so we can come into His presence. In His presence. That's what these last verses that we read, that we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence. The promise of God will bring you into the purpose of God. The purpose of God will bring you into the presence of God. That we enter into the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. As we look at the presence of God and coming into His presence, you can never come into His presence until you first come into the promise, the promise of salvation. And once you come into the promise of salvation, you come into the purpose of God, which is worship. And then as you worship God, you can come into His presence. Let me, let me ask you a question. You don't think, do you, that God created us here on this stage and put us here upon this earth to always be here? No. God's plan was never that Adam and, Lee, Adam and Eve live in the Garden of Eden perpetually for all time. There was no time before sin. What, what, what were they going to do? They were going to serve Him, worship Him, but one day they're going to enter into His presence. That's what the purpose of God is all about, that we enter into His presence. Now then, for me to, as best I can, explain coming into the presence of God, I'm, I'm going to go back to the help of the, of the tabernacle that God gave to Abraham, I mean to Moses, there at Mount Sinai. And it helps us understand coming into the presence of God. As you look at the tabernacle, there's a white fence that went all the way around. Here on the uh, bottom part, with a little uh, colored sign, that was the, the one gate, the one gate, the one door that you could enter in to where the presence. So how did you know the presence of God was there? At the Holy of Holies at the back, you could see the... Shekinah glory, or what the, the Jewish people would call the Shekinah, as that glory cloud came and resided there in the Holy of Holies on top of the mercy seat that was on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And you could see the, where God's presence was, and if you wanted to know how to come to God, you first had to come to the door. And there was only one way in. It was a door. It speaks of what Jesus Christ said. I am the door. And there is no other way to the Father but by me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. There was only one door. And you know what? If you came to that door and you didn't have a sacrifice, they would turn you away. Because you couldn't come into the presence of God without sacrifice. But right inside that door was called the brazen altar of sacrifice. It's the place of the shedding of blood. And God has always been firm on the fact that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. But it wasn't the blood of bulls and goats God was after because the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. All they could do was cover sin. But I want you to know the blood of the precious Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ who came to this earth, He became a man, He became one of us, and lived a sinless, spotless life. When He died on Calvary's cross, it wasn't the blood of bulls and goats that was offered. It was the blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And there just past that brazen altar that speaks of Calvary was what was called the laver. And it was, now we're trying to get to the presence of God. And before you can get to the presence of God, you've got to come through the doors of Christ. You've got to go to Calvary where He died. And then there was this laver. 
It was a bronze laver and it was polished where you could see yourself in it and there was water inside of it and it represented the washing of the water of the Word of God. You know what? If a priest tried to go into the holy place without washing himself, he would fall dead. And only a priest could go past the brazen altar of sacrifice to the holy place. And that... That, that labor speaks of our sanctification. As we become Christ-like, as we are become predestined to be conformed to His image, and God is beginning to do a work in our lives, this work of sanctification. And we examine ourselves and we see sins and spots and blemishes, and we are we're convicted of those. And when we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. We don't go back to the brazen altar to get saved again. We're cleansed through the washing of the water of the Word of God. And then, now we're still headed toward where the Shekinah glory presence of God is. Then we would come to the holy place, the place of priestly service. And right inside that holy place was the table of showbread. Speaks of the sustenance of us feeding on the Word of God. That Word is like meat. It's like food. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I don't have time to do it all justice, but just on the other side was the golden lampstand speaks of our illumination, speaks of what takes place as the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and illumines it and causes it to become alive and living in our hearts and lives. And it becomes a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And we don't have to live in darkness anymore. And then right up next to the Holy of Holies, inside the holy place, was the golden prayer altar. The closest you could get to the presence of God was the golden prayer altar. Doesn't that speak volumes to us? Doesn't that speak volumes to us of why we need to pray? The closest you can ever get to God without actually being in His presence is when we're on our knees praying. And then there was the Holy of Holies. And inside the Holy of Holies was this one box called the Ark of the Covenant. On top of the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat and two gold-winged cherubim that came up. And there, between those cherubim, on top of the mercy seat, on top of the Ark of the Covenant, came down the Shekinah glory presence of God. But when you came there, and you come past the holy place, There wasn't a door. There wasn't a way into where the presence of God actually was. It speaks of what is stated that the way the Holy Spirit, this is in the ninth chapter if you want to turn over in Hebrews. It says in verse 7, But unto the second part, the Holy of Holies, the, the high priest went alone, Once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all, or the holy of holies, was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was just symbolic. There was no way into the presence of God. God brings you all the way through the door, through the brazen altar, which represents Calvary, to the washing of the water of the Word of God at the laver, to the place of priestly service, with the feeding on the Word of God, the illumination by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, prayer altar as we pray, and then there's a four-inch thick veil that only one man could go behind, and him only once a year, 
And he didn't go in there first without blood that he sprinkled for himself and then for the sins of the people. And it was such, such a, a holy thing that the rabbinic writing says they'd tie a rope on his foot in case he erred in some way and God struck him dead where they could pull him out of there. The Holy Spirit indicating that there was no way in while that first tabernacle stood. Jump over to chapter 10. Look down in verse 19. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He consecrated for us through the veil that is His flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What God did, He took what was separating us from Him, flesh. He wrapped it around the flesh of Jesus. He wrapped around His glory, His deity, and He sent Him to this earth. And the Bible says that a new and living way which He consecrated for us through the veil, and His veil was representative of His flesh. So how, how did that be? You remember when Jesus died on Calvary's cross and He said, It is finished. What took place? The Bible says that the veil in the temple was rent into from top to bottom. Boom. Signifying that there was a new and living way where there was no way before. You know what? Before Jesus came to this earth, no man ever went to heaven. You say, Enoch went to heaven. No, he didn't go to heaven. You say, how do you know? The Bible says there was no way. We just read it. You say, well, Elijah went to heaven. No, he didn't. The Bible says before Jesus Christ and His death on the cross, there was no way into the presence of God. Jesus Christ, is, He's the first fruits not only of resurrection, He's the first fruits of those going into heaven. He led captivity captive. That means He entered first. And He comes into the presence of God. And He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Now then, you and I have a new and living way to come into the presence of God. I'm out of time. Peter tells us that in the presence of God, there's joy unspeakable. Paul tells us that in the presence of God, there's perfect contentment and perfect satisfaction. John tells us that in the presence of God, there's fellowship <laughs> as we're accepted in the Beloved. We're part of that family now. Fellowship, satisfaction, contentment, joy unspeakable. All of these things you find in the presence of God. And one day, one day, we're going to get to go, not spiritually, but we're going to go in physically. One day. When we receive that glorified body at the time of the rapture, we're going to get to enter into the place where Jesus Christ actually is. If we were to die today, we'd get to enter into that place. But you know what? The Bible tells us, also in the book of Romans, that we can come boldly to the throne. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You say, how can we do that? Because we have an anchor of the soul. We have a forerunner who's gone before us. The Lord Jesus Christ. And we have our soul anchored and we have a lifeline that brings us right into the presence of God when we choose to go. You can go into the presence of God right now. You first got to go through the door. Who's Jesus? You got to come to the place of Calvary where the shed blood of Jesus took place. 
You've got to come to salvation and experience the promise of salvation. And then you've got to come to the labor. If you've got known sin in your life that you've not confessed, you're not going to come into the presence of God. You need to come to the place of priestly service, of feeding on the Word, being illumined, illumined by the Spirit of God. Come in prayer. And you can come right into the very presence of God. Joy unspeakable. Perfect satisfaction. Perfect contentment. Perfect fellowship. And there and only there can you obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Into his presence. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you for your precious word, how it so speaks to us, how it so encourages us, and so enlightens us. Help us as believers to come into your presence. And we do so by Jesus, the new and living way that he made for us through his death on the cross, and we thank you for it. Father, for anyone in here that doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, may this moment, right now, be the time where they will turn from their self and their sin and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior and commit their life to Him in faith. Thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for what you're going to do. Father, thank you so much, and most of all for Jesus. We pray all this in His name. Amen. Let's stand together. Eric's going to lead us in this hymn of invitation. As we sing, you respond and come as the Lord is leading in your life. Take my life. Take my life and let it be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee Take my moments and my days Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for Thee. Swift and beautiful for thee. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight. Carrie Allen, please dismiss us in prayer, brother.